Hey y'all, Dixie here. I had a request for some more information about my pictured rocks hike. Folks were asking what my itinerary was or if I would change anything about my trip. So today I wanna to go into more detail about the logistics of that trip. For those of y'all who missed it, a couple of weeks ago, I did a 42 mile section hike of the North Country Trail through Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore area. And if you're not familiar with that area, it's in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So you're walking along the shoreline most of the time with breathtaking views. I'll include links to any of the important websites that I'm gonna talk about in this video. So make sure you check the video description for all of that information and where to get your permits, backcountry planner, etc. My hike was from June 10th through June 14th. So it was a five day, four night trip, which in my opinion is perfect. The terrain is pretty relaxed. The Western half, I guess you could say, is a little more hilly like rolling hills so you're kind of up and down but no extreme climbing or anything that's just crazy in the way of elevation change so i definitely could have shaved off some days on this trip but i didn't want to because i knew it was going to be really pretty there would be things to explore and poke around and look at and i also didn't want to stretch it out too long to where i was going to have to carry a bunch of weight in food so five days of food is really all i care to carry if i have the option so that was kind of the middle ground between not rushing things but also not packing too much weight so if you take 42 miles and divide it by five days that comes out to 8.4 miles per day when i was booking and making my reservations for my backcountry permit, I kept that number in mind, 8.4. I tried to aim for that, but some sites were booked up and I couldn't hit that mark exactly anyway because it's not like a designated camping site is at every 8.4 miles. And on the Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore slash North Country Trail, you can only camp at the designated backcountry camping site. So anyway, that was my number to kind of aim for daily. There were some days where I had to do a little bit shy of that and then make it up on days later in the trip. The backcountry planner is useful when you're trying to figure out campsites. They've got a map to show you where the campsites are and some information about whether you can have a fire at the campsite if there's a fire ring or whether or not there will be water access at your campsite and so those are things to definitely consider when you're figuring out where you're going to camp because i would prefer to have the option for water and fire neither was a complete deal breaker but if i can choose between a site that maybe i'll have to go another mile to get to and I can have a fire and water, well then of course I'm gonna do that instead of going a mile shy and not having those options. Even though I booked about five or so weeks in advance, I still didn't nail the exact sites that I wanted, which it worked out anyway, it was fine. But this is one of those trips that you definitely want to book ahead of time so that you're not coming up with just the leftovers and it makes it difficult or maybe even impossible to plan your trip because there aren't properly spaced sites and it, it just becomes a nightmare. But anyway, the campsites that I ended up with for night one, I was at O Sable campsite, which is at 7.1 miles. For night two, I was at Seven Mile Creek which is mile 14.4, night three at Cove's campsite, mile 21.7, and finally night four, Potato Patch at mile 33.5. So the only campsite that I guess I would say I didn't really care for is the Potato Patch campsite, and that's just because there wasn't access directly to the lake from that campsite. A lot of the campsites, you've got a little trail that leads off to where you set up your tents and everything and there's a communal fire ring if that particular campsite has a fire ring and then usually across from that little trail there's a path to go down to the lake well at potato patch there was a little stream just before camp and i was going in the westbound direction and then just past camp 0.3 miles there was access to the lake but it was straight down a hill so i did go down the hill past the campsite 
to watch the sunset and collect some water and everything. It's not that big of a deal, but coming back up that hill when you're already tired and you've hiked a full day, it's just not ideal. As a side note for people who like to watch sunsets and sunrises, I mean, who doesn't enjoy that? Uh, most of the campsites, if they have access to the water, you will be able to see the sunset. The first campsite I stayed at, which was the O'Sable, that one, I wouldn't have been able to see the sunset from the lake access point right there, but just a few tenths of a mile or so down the trail, there's a lighthouse where you can catch a spectacular sunset. And then if you wanted to catch the sunrise, that's possibly the only campsite where you could do that. I don't know, there is one campsite just before O'Sable. I didn't scope out the situation there to see if you could see a, a sunrise. But anyway, from O'Sable for sure, I know you can catch the sunrise. So I thought that was cool to be at a campsite where somewhat conveniently you could see both. But the rest of the time past O'Sable, I was not at a campsite where I would have been positioned to be able to see a sunrise. The campsites are really nice. They have selected them for the best flat ground. They also have bear boxes, which makes it really convenient to deal with that situation. You don't have to hang a bag. They also have privies at each of the campsites, so you might have an emergency where you have to dig a hole, but you pass campsites throughout the day or you know, you're know you at one in the morning and then at night. So there are a lot of opportunities to not have to dig a cat hole, which in my opinion is nice. Also, if you aim to go with a group larger than six, there are group campsites, but if you've got six or less, then you can camp at the individual sites. In addition to your backcountry camping permit, you also need to pay for entry at the park itself. And I know when you go to a lot of national parks, there's a big gate that you enter and somebody's there to take your money, but this place isn't like that. You can just pull in and park at one of the visitor center parking lots and there's nothing to really prompt you to pay that fee. Now you can pay for your entry fee at the visitor center, but we knew we were gonna be there before they opened and we wanted to park and leave a vehicle and then shuttle to the other end. So you can order your parking permit slash pay your entry fee and print out the little voucher for that and then you just leave it in your dash in the parking lot. That park entry fee if you're gonna come in by car is ten dollars. If you're coming in by foot or bicycle it's five dollars. They have all sorts of different information but if you're gonna park and leave your vehicle then ten dollars make sure your permits in the dash. So again we parked at Munising Falls Visitor Center and then shuttled over to Grand Sable Visitor Center and then hiked back to the car. I prefer to do that because I don't like to know that I've got to be somewhere at a certain time and a shuttle's waiting to pick me up. That just adds stress and pressure to the trip. So knowing I'm hiking back to my car at whatever speed I want to is what I prefer. So all in all, this trip for two people to stay the night, shuttle services, and entry into the park came out to $135. If you wanna stay in the area the night before you're set to start your trip, there are some hotel and restaurant options in Munising, and it's like just a few miles from the visitor center. The shuttle service, which like I said, I will link to in the video description, does recommend that you book with them at least a week in advance. The weather while I was in Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore was pretty nice, all things considered. With it being right there on the water, I guess you could always end up having some rain, but thankfully we only had one day of rain. The highs were mostly, I would say, in the mid 60s or so during the day, but the last day ended up getting close to 80 degrees, I believe. And then at night, I would say most nights were probably lower 40s. The night that it rained, it might have dipped down into the upper 30s, but it was nothing miserable. I think the only better season to go hike pictured rocks would possibly be the fall. And that's because the temperatures will be pretty similar at that time of year, but also you will probably get to see some fall colors. And I think that area as gorgeous as it is already with fall colors would just be mind-blowing. I guess one could argue that the summer would be 
better because it's hot outside, hot enough that you're like, okay, I'm about to get in this water and swim. But honestly, Lake Superior is like freezing cold all the time. So I can't imagine that even in the summertime, I'd want to do more than get in the water up to my knees. But I'm going to tell you, some of those people that live up north, there were folks in the water when it was like lower 60s outside. So I think when you live up north, you just become acclimated to that and y'all have like some sort of polar bear gene or something that we don't have down here in the south. But I also think that the summer could be more problematic or even later in the spring due to bugs. And that leads me to my next topic. Before I went out on this trail, I announced that I was heading out to Pictured Rocks and I probably got like a hundred comments combined with YouTube and social media of people saying, oh my gosh, I hope that you're gonna take a bug net and some bug spray. I know you don't like using those things, but you're gonna be absolutely miserable and you might die if you don't do it. But to be honest, I don't really love to use bug spray and I definitely don't like wearing a bug net on my head. I don't know, I just feel claustrophobic and like I'm suffocating. So thankfully I ended up not needing either of those and the bug situation wasn't really a problem at all. A handful of mosquitoes here and there, but no different than anywhere else this time of year. With that said though, I think we got pretty lucky. We were kind of in between two different fly seasons. The locals were telling me, well, you got this fly season and then you got that fly season. And right now we're kind of in mosquito season, uh, but the backcountry planner does warn against bugs and also goes into those different types of fly seasons. So it's something that I think you should definitely prepare for just in case. Even having uh, rain gear like a rain jacket and rain pants to put on at least so you get a little break from them if you want to stop and sit and take a break and eat lunch. Uh, but I imagine in the summertime putting on rain gear would be pretty miserable and hot. So there are little bug net jackets and pants that you can get. I'm going to link to those also in the video description. This is something that I've seen a few people use in really densely populated mosquito areas and there were a couple of times out west that I wish that I had had something like this. So anyway, I've heard that they work well and it wouldn't be a bad idea to have those with you. And as far as ticks go, we only saw one tick the whole time we were out there and it was not attached. But of course these things can fluctuate year to year, season to season, and heck even week to week. Cell phone service. We were told to expect to have absolutely no cell phone service out in the Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore, but we actually had a decent amount of service, especially the first day. And then I think somewhere in the middle there might have been a day, I think like the second day and maybe part of the third day where we did not have any service at all. And then the last couple of days there was some spotty service and it turned into pretty strong service as we got closer to the town of Munising. I use Verizon Wireless, so I can't speak to any other provider, but if any of y'all have been out there with a different service provider and you had cell service or didn't at all, please feel free to share that in the comments. I do always carry an inReach with me, that way I can communicate regardless of cell service, but if you don't have an inReach, this is one of those trails where I would still feel relatively safe and like the risk was pretty low because it is a high trafficked trail, not in the way that it's just crazy busy all the time, and you don't ever get any peace and quiet, but you do see people out there. There are folks passing through. You likely will be camping with people. You know, the amount of folks out there is controlled because it is only a limited amount of backcountry camping permits per site, per night. But also there are a lot of different bailout points and trailheads along the way. So if you got into some kind of issue, you can likely walk to a parking area and chances are they're gonna be folks there visiting for a day hike and they could get you help if you needed it. Something that I wondered about before I went out to Picture Rocks is, are dogs allowed? Because this is a hike that I would have liked to have taken Fancy May on. Unfortunately, they do not allow dogs on the North Country Trail through the Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore area. Now, with that said, there are some points of interest that did allow dogs 
like the lighthouse, for example. So if you're looking at just sightseeing, there may be some areas where your dog is allowed. And if that's a deal breaker for you, it's something that you should definitely check into ahead of time. But as far as taking a dog from one end to the other on the trail, they don't allow that. All in all, I absolutely loved this trail. I'm glad I finally got to go out there and do it. And I think that whether you're somebody who is seasoned at hiking or a beginner, this trail would be great for you, especially you beginners who are a little timid about how to handle things like bear bagging on this trail. You don't have to do that because you've got bear boxes provided for you at each campsite. For the people who are a little nervous about having to dig a hole and go to the bathroom in the woods, there are privies at each campsite. So again, you're gonna pass them during the day. You'll wake up at one and go to sleep at one. And then with all the different bailout points, I just think that that could offer some comfort for somebody who's slowly trying to transition into it. And with there being different trailheads, you don't have to do the whole 42 mile stretch. You can say, all right, I think I feel comfortable with three days and two nights or two days and one night. You know, that's something that could still be arranged somewhere along this trail. So I finally got out and did a section of the North Country Trail. And I've had a lot of people ask me is, through hiking the North Country Trail on your radar. And I would like to do a blanket statement here and say, no, it's not really on my radar. I mean, kind of because it's an existing trail that is a through hike, but I'm just not interested in being that cold for that long. So let's just say I will hike a lot of other things before I will ever through hike the North Country Trail, but doing sections might be a thing. All right, y'all, well, that is all I have for you today. If you've got any questions about my trip to the Picture Rocks, I'm happy to answer those in the comments below. And if you've been there or you can weigh in on a, an experience that you had a certain time of year you prefer or one that was really buggy and you wouldn't suggest, I would love to hear those comments as well to help other people who are planning a trip to that area. Thank y'all so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe before you go and we will see y'all next time.